Welcome to the RSM Talk Big podcast, helping you invest well, understand money and achieve the best tax outcomes. Your hosts today are Andrew Sykes, Chris Oates and Young Han. Hey everyone and welcome to the RSM Talk Big podcast. I'm your host today and I'm joined in the studio with my regular co-host, Young Han. Hey everyone. And Chris Oates. G'day everyone. Today we're going to be catching up with Kate Carnell. Kate's had a diversified background and she's recently become chair of an ASX listed company. So Kate started out in pharmacy, went on to be the ACT chief minister, a diversified career from there, there, including small business ombudsman, and as I said, recently moved into becoming an ASX chair, which is an exciting role. So we're going to have a chat with Kate today, and we're going to talk about what it looks like setting up and and being involved in an ASX listed company, uh, the pressures of being a, a chair, and what the future looks like. Andrew, you've been involved in a few IPO process. So when is the right time to list? That's a really good question. I think the right time to list is when the company reaches a certain maturity and it needs more capital. But I think we often forget that the main reason that the ASX exists is so companies can raise capital. Quite often it's seen as being speculative and that creates pricing pressure on companies. But it's really you've got a really good business, you know you can expand it, and all you need to do is inject uh, capital into it. So that's where we've worked with companies doing that. Yeah, and Andrew, working in it, the process is a, it doesn't happen overnight. So where do you start? What, it's easy to be sitting there thinking it'd be great to be an ASS, ASX listed company, but <laughs> you've got to start somewhere and, and then how long does it take? Really good question. Uh, it, it takes a while and it's an enormous amount of work. You'd be surprised by the amount of work. So uh, the one we've uh, worked on, and Kate, you would have yes. seen a lot of the work involved in that. Huge wasn't, work. <laughs> it was a lot more work than we thought, wasn't it? It, it was, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's about a 12 to 18 month process. And we work closely with brokers and the, the stockbroker is the one that actually works on attracting the money. So they will uh, go and select what they call cornerstone investors. And yes. how many meetings did you have with cornerstone investors, Kate? Oh, there was lots um, uh, over weeks and weeks. Um, yeah, um, can't remember exactly how many, but it would have been, you know, 30 plus. Yeah, Yep, and and that involves doing the same presentation 30, 35 times, times over a two or three week period. So it's a lot of shoe leather, it's a lot of hard work, but it takes about 12 months from start to finish. And if you've got a good company with the right idea, it's there's money out there. Look, that absolutely proved to be the case, didn't it? There is money out, out there for the right investment. Yeah. And uh, the one you were involved with, Kate, racing and sports, how many times oversubscribed was that? Do you recall? Um, it was six to seven times oversubscribed, but the company had existed for 20 years, had been profitable during most of that time, but was just looking at growth. So needed capital. Yeah. it's You probably would have known your, your notes off like the back of your hand by the time you were at the end of the last presentation. <laughs> uh, look, absolutely. Um, and because it's a family company, this one, um, it was very much, uh, it, was a, it was a closely held company. I mean, not, not in the technical term, I suppose, but these, it had been the family, the, the CEO is a, was part of the family, as were the founders, and so on it went. So for them, the change was quite significant moving outside the family, moving into the, into the market and looking for uh, new investors. So big, big change, but really important change. Yeah, and what part of the process do, do well, Kate, do you come into it? Because it starts out, obviously, Andrew, you at yeah. the beginning, but then you need to bring in the chair yeah. at some great, stage. Great question, Chris. And when you start out with a small company, they quite often don't have a formal board. So the first step in the process for us was going out and finding a board. Uh, we went through a selection process and we went and found deep industry experience. Um, and then we got some legal and we got some accounting. And then we tried to work out the, the leadership. 
Uh, quite often, you'll find that small business and, and big business, uh, any performance is constrained by the leadership. So critical to us was finding uh, someone not who had industry experience, but had leadership experience, which can transfer from one domain to the next. Um, and that's where we, we found Kate. And I'm very pleased you did because it's a, a great little company and great people. So it's been a, been a ride, but uh, it's just starting, isn't it? Now we've got to deliver. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that must be intimidating. Uh, look, it is intimidating because it is about moving away from um, a small business, a family business, uh, to where we're responsible to for delivering on a prospectus, responsible to the ASX, to the reporting requirements, um, to delivery, uh, and still doing it off the back of what is still quite a small a small business. But we're planning to grow quickly. And based on the recent um, stats, out of 200 ASX listed companies, there's only 5% of them actually had a female CEO. So I guess this new gig, what excites you the most? <laughs> well, um, for me, um, having a small business background myself, having been around both politics, small business industry associations, it's great to be able to uh, support and be part of a small business, small family business, small Canberra family business, um, and to help take them to the next phase of uh, of their of their growth. And part of the twenty nine million that we we raised, well, a good part, um, is going to international expansion. You know, improving our product mix. That means employing people. You know, there's a whole range of things. Many of those things I've had something to do with before. So it's really great to be able to work with the family, but work, uh, you know, in that more international growth product expansion space as well. So being a, a chair of a board, how much different is it to being a director? Do you have to work harder as a chair? Um, I think your, your role as a, as, as a chair, and I'm on a number of other boards of which I'm not the chair, but as chair the issue is to do to keep focus, to ensure that members of the board really feel part of the operation, feel like they're properly informed, uh, to ensure that there's no surprises. I think, you know, that people are um, know the decisions that we've got to make, that, we, that we're clear about the direction, but really to keep the board um, together and cohesive um, and uh, focused on delivering on our perspectives because that's what we said we'd deliver. Yeah, that's what you're accountable to. RSM's looked at this problem for a number of years and we've seen and some of our research shows that companies with boards grow up to 70% faster. Do you think that would be because management is accountable to their decisions? Um, I think that what having a board does is it makes the company uh, – focus on strategic direction and delivery and reporting. And I think that one of the dilemmas, if you don't have a board, is you're reporting to yourself. Mm. Um, and that means you can always give yourself a bit of slack, shall we say. And what a good board will always do is ensure there is a proper business plan, good strategic direction, that it's underpinned by, um, by research and good fact in the space. And that things like the financials, are robust, things like that, that often may slip through the cracks without a board. Are you seeing things now that you would actually take back to small business to provide some of that accountability? Look, absolutely. Um, I think it's been really interesting to see racing and sport, you know, again, set up by uh, by two, two people 20 years ago who had a real um, vision for the need for good data, particularly in the racing area, but in the sport area as well, that grew a bit. Members of the family came on board. Some, you know, up, some other people came on board, and so and so on. So, um, what I'm seeing now is how important, from a small business perspective, it is is to move, to, you know, to move into having um, a board or a level of accountability. Now, whether that's an advisory board. Um, which you know sometimes works for really little businesses or a full um, corporate board um, is a matter for what the where the company's up to. I think, Kate, your background, your journey, starting as a small business, 
being involved in politics now, becoming a chair, brings a lot of experience and advice that could bring to the racing and sports. But in your journey, um, when you made those changes in your career, what was the pivoting point? Look, I've always had the view that you do what you're doing now and you do it as you do it well. Uh, and you have a very clear focus on what you're doing. Um, I'll give you a really quick story. Um, when I bu- bought my first pharmacy, I was 25. Um, I thought I knew everything. I didn't. <laughs> I knew a lot about being a pharmacist, but not a lot about running a business. I gave this great presentation to my staff. To start with, there was a spreadsheet. Back in those days, there were overheads. <laughs> Nobody remembers. You don't know what that was, but I can promise you. Overhead projector. Uh, yeah. Um, I anyway, do. Uh, um, and my staff, you know, went to sleep in five minutes. I mean, the reality is, I learnt pretty quickly that it was important to have a clear um, focus and um, a, a clear approach to what you were trying to do in the business, rather than a spreadsheet, mm-hmm. which wasn't terribly efficient, really. So. Um, I think I was a good pharmacist. I ended up in politics because I was involved in the Chamber of Commerce and the Pharmacy Guild, got approached to stand, thought, yep, give that a show because I really wanted to make, it sounds a bit trite, but I really wanted to make a difference. We were lobbying politicians back in from the Pharmacy Guild perspective. Um, I thought that it was important to try to change the space from the inside rather than from the outside, got involved in politics, became chief minister. You know, but I think everything I've done, I've tried to focus on what I'm doing now, you know, how to be the best I can and focusing on what the deliverables are. You know, I think small business particularly has a tendency to spray a bit, you know, to be trying to do too many things at once and therefore not delivering um, on the important things for the business. And, of course, as we know, because I'm talking to accountants here, yes. losing uh, focus on cash. Mm. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Nothing will kill your business quicker than running out of cash. Profit and cash are two different things, and yep. cash is it's really important. Com- yeah, really, really <laughs> important. I agree with your comments there on focus. How, how did you maintain focus while you were in business? Um, after getting it wrong a few times, by the way, mm. um, and and spraying and starting a few different little businesses back in those days, vitamin businesses and so on. I realised you couldn't be you you couldn't be good um, at a whole lot of things all at the same time. And for me, with a couple of kids as well. So the important bit was to focus on what really counted uh, for, for your business, and that can be quite narrow. For me, in the pharmacies, um, I wanted to be the best professional pharmacy that was um, that I could be, and I wanted to get to a point where I could speak to every single customer that came in by name. I know that might seem like a very narrow perspective, but it meant I didn't get involved in lots of specials out the front of the pharmacy particularly because that wasn't in line with what we were trying to do. It did mean that I was focusing on computerization to have better customer um, customer information, which back then you know, now it's simple. Thing, yes. <laughs> well, my Apple IIe computer, <laughs> you know, there you go. Back, that's a long time ago. But it was about focusing on exactly what I wanted to do and how we were going to be different. Point of difference matters. Yeah, and that's in all the different roles, as you said, focus being a key thing. To make your role successful, what are a couple of things that you've carried through you, through with you to make sure that I guess you stay you and keep on task? Um, I think there's something called situational leadership. Here you go. I mean, I think leadership is what is is what you have to focus on, and that means bringing, uh, getting the most out of your staff, bringing your staff with you, it being a team, a family, whatever you want to you want to put it. Which means that there is really different approaches, say, from sitting around a cabinet table, you know, in the ACT assembly. How I kept my boys because they were boys, um, you know, on the same on the same field. Um, was different from from pharmacy, was different from, you know, the Chamber of Commerce or, for that matter, um, the small business ombudsman scenario. So it's about, you know, leading for the situation you're, you're dealing with uh, and making sure that your people understand what you're doing um, and that the approach you take is in line with the target, the outcomes. That probably sounds a little bit um, circuitous, but it's actually not. It, 
you know, that's what leadership is, really. No, I, I don't think it's secured us at all. I think that small business people in particular quite often forget that their primary job is team leader. Yep, and by a country, that is the job. And mm. it's the job as chief minister, it's the job as CEO, and to some extent job the, the job as chair of, um, of an ASX-listed company because you are um, getting the most out of your people, ensuring delivery and staying focused. Yeah, and so when we look in as well, the lessons that you've learnt along the way, so not always good lessons, not always bad lessons, but a couple of the, the key lessons that you have had. Um, one of the things I learnt really early and uh, was that it's never the right time. <laughs> this sound, <laughs> if you're really hoping that all the ducks align before you, you take a step or you make a decision, um, the ducks will have flown away by the time. So you have to have the guts, the entrepreneurial spirit to say, okay, it feels right. I've got enough information, maybe not a hundred percent of it, enough information and jump. Because, it, you know, if, if I'd, if I hadn't st um, stood for the ACT assembly because my kids were little, then my whole life would have been different. But I did. Um, if I hadn't sort of put my hand up for chief minister, my life would have been different. If I hadn't taken jobs as CEO and so on, so the fact is you've got to do stuff when yeah, when there's a whole range of reasons why you wouldn't, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as, as accountants, we quite often, often get called on to give a range of advice and a piece of advice I always give, it's, it's never a good time to buy a house, it's never a good time to have a family and it's never a good time to start a business or change career. Um, and it's absolutely true. So if you wait for all of those ducks to be in a line yep. before you move, you'll never move and the ducks will have flown away. Well, opportunity opportunity knocks and if you're too afraid to answer the door, Speaking you can offer and miss out. Yes, yeah. speaking of that, Kate, because um, I'm in that journey to build my career, I have kids um, and do a bit of both. So if you were to go back to a younger version of you, what kind of advice would you want to give to that person? <laughs> um, look, it's that you can't be good at everything and you can't do everything. So if you want to have a, a, a career, um, obviously your kids have to come first. It's a really good idea to try to preserve your partner your marriage, if that's what you've you've got. So those things really matter. Your career really matters, but keeping your house tidy and the garden nice um, <laughs> and a whole range of other stuff can be outsourced really efficiently. So it's about working what matter looking at what matters to you. Right. And focusing on the things that matter to but you. Or also adding on to that. What's your advice for the employers and the businesses who's looking to have more of those talented females? Oh, can I say I will employ women with young kids every day of the week because they're so much better organised than blokes. <laughs> um, don't, so waste, <laughs> don't waste as much time. Don't waste yeah. and can't waste time. So the, the women I've employed and there's lots over the years now with young families that are focused on their on on their their career on their jobs. They're just well organised. They don't stuff around. They get stuff done and they deliver because they have to. That's really good advice. <laughs> <laughs> see, Andrew, <laughs> the right person. Uh, I very much lines up with with what I see in the work workplace, and and uh, a lot of my senior team are all women. And they all have families, and they do their work and go home. <laughs> and, and that really matters, Andrew, because so often I have to say in a workplace, people who get in early stay really late. You think they're working really hard. It's just that they stuff around. Whereas um, if you've got to go and pick up the kids or if you, you know, if you don't want to leave the kids at the childcare centre because they go to the lost children's home or something. <laughs> um, so um, those are the people who have to get stuff done by a time um, and they deliver. Excellent. So you see plenty of opportunities ahead as uh, ASX chair. It's an unfolding role. Um, and thank you very much for your time today, Kate. It's been terrific. Um, I'm Andrew. I've been joined by uh, Young and Chris. This is the RSM Talk Big podcast, and we'll catch you next time. Uh, Phil, go to your favourite podcast platform, uh, find us, subscribe, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Talk Big. Create, save, and protect with RSM.